Let's get started with this uh, final session of the week. We will have now a, a talk by uh, Christian Fischer on exotic uh, hadrons from functional methods. Please go ahead, uh, share your slides and uh, the stage is all yours. So thank you very much. Can you see my screen and my pointer? Everything is uh, perfectly visible. Thanks. Very good. Okay, so in this talk, I will uh, discuss some issues related to exotic hadrons uh, from functional methods. Uh, as on Monday, I start with a picture of, of FAIR as it uh, status of uh, September 2020. Uh, and uh, we hope that in a couple of years, uh, roughly in this area here, uh, we will have the PANDA experiment uh, taking place, which is related, of course, to these topics. So my talk is divided into three parts. I will start with a pure Young-Mills theory and uh, discuss with you some recent results on, on glue balls and, and also discuss the issue of truncation schemes again, a little bit uh, going along in this talk. In a very brief second part, um, I'll, I'll go for quark masses and light meson spectroscopy again with the aim to elucidate a little bit uh, what we can do uh, nowadays in the starting schwinger peter peter framework with uh, quite advanced truncation schemes. And then in the third part, I come to the topic related to the, section, to the session, namely the heavy quarks. Um, in particular, I will treat the issue of heavy light uh, tetra quarks, the X3872 uh, and, and others. And I should say this is uh, work uh, together um, with my with postdocs, uh, Marcus Huber, Helios Sanchez Alepus, um, Richard Williams, uh, former PhD students, uh, Walter Heubel, uh, and uh, uh, Jaron Eichmann, uh, postdoc, and, and the former PhD student, uh, Paul Albot, and the current PhD student, uh, Nico Santowski. So in glue balls, we all know this picture. So this is the, the first results on glue balls in, in the quenched lattice theory from Morningstar and Pearden. And uh, not so much has changed in, in, in all the years since then. Um, the, actually, I think it's fair to say that most calculations on the lattice are quenched, most if not almost all of them. Um, uh, there were a couple of attempts to do unquenched calculations of the glue balls, but it appeared to be that these are actually very involved. Um, now, in, in our framework, uh, using Dyson Schwinger and Peter Sapiro equations, um, we hope to, to acquire, in addition, of course, to the spectrum, uh, some structural information, some insights into the internal structure of these, of these glue balls. Uh, and I will explain a little bit how, what I mean with this. Now, we start with pure Young Mills theory. Um, what you see here is the Dyson Schwinger equation for the non perturbative gluon propagator in Landau Gage Jan Mills theory. Uh, and this is the, the generic setup for all Dyson Schwinger equations. On, on the left hand side, you have the fully dressed quantities, here the inverse gluon propagator. On the right hand side, you have the bare quantities for the primitive divergent uh, functions, here the bare gluon propagator. And there are dressing diagrams which are all non perturbative. And just for simplicity of notation, I have omitted this blob in these internal gluon propagators, but it, it's actually there. So this is really a self-consistency equation so that the dressed gluon appears again in all of these uh, um, um, diagrams here. And there's the ghost. Um, the ghost has its own Dyson Schwinger equation, which is considerably simpler than the one for the gluon. Um, so these two are the two point functions in Young Mills theory. And on the right hand side, you can see fully dressed three point functions, the ghost gluon vertex, the three gluon vertex, and the four gluon vertex, which satisfy their own Dyson Schwinger equations. And, so, and this is actually how we, how we treat the problem. So the, the first approaches to Young Mills theory in this framework was calculating these propagators using unsetsive for the vertices as input. Unsetsive, which you model along Slavnov Taylor identities. Um, which of course take the perturbative limit into account and, and things like that. However, we, we moved on from, from these first approaches and included the next step, the next level in a, in a vertex expansion of QCD, which are the vertices. So we, in addition, solved Dyson-Schwinger equations for the ghost gluon vertex, 
the three gluon vertex and the four gluon vertex. So now all primitively divergent functions in Yang-Mills theory are included. Now, these dyson schwinger equations again contain higher green points functions, five point functions and so on. And in this truncation scheme, these are approximated using a skeleton expansion, again, in terms of dressed propagators and three and, and four point vertices. And this closes the equations. So this is now, I would say, the, the most advanced closed equation of dyson schwinger equation, which has been devised by Marcus Huber and solved by Marcus Huber that we have at our disposal. Um, with this recipe for closing, we can actually do a parameter-free calculation. The, the, the whole system of equations is, is self-contained. Um, what, you, what you get by doing this is shown here in this plot where we have the gluon dressing function and the ghost dressing function as a function of um, Euclidean momenta, so space-like momenta. And it's compared with lattice calculations. And you see that the, the results in this framework here in red nicely agree with the corresponding lattice data. There is some uncertainty with uh, gauge fixing associated with Grebov copies, which, which is uh, represented here by, by this spread. But, but apart from these, these I would say, um, um, this is one parameter family actually of solutions that we find in infrared everything else is, is fixed. Now, what we did is we, we used these solutions um, in the space-like momenta to make, um, 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 to, to go into the time-like momentum as well. And the reason why we do this is, of course, we want to solve beta sub beta equations for these glue balls. You see those here. Um, in, in this framework, a, a glue ball is uh, a buildup of two gluons, uh, which, which are then interact via gluon exchange or here via a ghost exchange. And there's a second way how you can make, for example, scalar glue balls, namely they con consist of a ghost and a ghost pair. So what you need to solve is, is a coupled set of beta sub beta equations for these two quantities here. Now this quantity can be represented in terms of two different tensor structures and this one adds one additional tensor structure. And without going into much of the details, let me just discuss the results of this calculation with you. What you see here is the result for the scalar glue ball, the first radial excitation of the scalar, the second radial excitation of the scalar, the pseudoscalar glue ball ground state, and again, first radial excitation and second radial excitation as calculated by Marcus Huber and, and Helios sanchez Alepos, And we compare the result from our dyson schwinger bittis hapita framework with, on the one hand, the lattice data from Morningstar Piran from 1999. And on the other hand, very recent lattice data in, in, from, from Atenodoru and, and Tepper, uh, actually from, from June this year. And I think the overall agreement is, is, is very, very nice. So for the ground states and for the excited states, the, the, uh, um, the masses that we obtain in our framework are within a couple of percent of the masses that we get from the lattice. And the, the reason why the spectrum matches so well is that we can use this very highly advanced truncation scheme. We actually had a couple of trial calculations using a, a truncations which were inferior to that, so using, using ansätze for the vertices and so on. And we actually discovered that they kind of break the system. They introduce errors which are almost of the order of the masses of those that we get. So you really have to do this. This you really have to include this this, this part of the tower of, of the disease to obtain these these high quality results. Now, what do I mean with the internal structure? Um, this you can see here. These are the beta sub beta amplitudes on the one hand for the scalar here for the first radial excitation of the scalar. And you can see that the ground state is actually dominated from one of the two gluonic beta sub beta amplitudes. And there's roughly a 10% contribution from the ghost. So which definitely cannot be neglected. For the first radial excitation, observe the zero crossings here of the wave functions. Uh, it, this one is actually dominated from the other gluonic component. And then the one which was leading here also plays a 10% role. And the ghost is completely absent. 
So the internal structure is different between the ground and the excited states. And of course, some when, when we hopefully uh, succeed to go to the full way towards unquenched blue balls, this could lead to interesting insights in what contributes to which observable in experiments. Okay, so with this, I come to the quite short second part of this talk. Um, so I hope I convinced you that in the mill sector, we have a quite advanced truncation scheme at our disposal, which um, serves to produce high quality results. Now, what can we do when we include the matter sector? So full QCE. Again, we start with the propagators. Here we have the dyson schwinger equation for the quark propagator. On the right hand side, again, this, this guy appears again, and there's the fully dressed gluon and the quark gluon vertex here. Um, these are the two equations that we know already from the ML sector for the gluon and the ghost. And now in addition, we have a, a, a dressed quark loop here running around in the one for the gluon. And we include the vertices, three gluon vertex again, ghost gluon vertex again, and the quark gluon vertex. This is actually the most advanced truncation scheme that has been employed in quarks included. It includes the back reaction onto the gluon in the gluon and in the vertex equations. It does not include the four point, the four point vertex uh, equation. Um, this is something we, we, we still have to do in that truncation. So the four point is actually uh, um, basically neglected. Still, it's a highly complicated set of equations uh, to be solved and that Richard Williams was the one uh, together with, with Walter Heupel who did this work. Now, in, in the next slide, I will compare results for the meson spectrum in this highly advanced truncation scheme to a, a much more simpler truncation scheme, which has been used widely in phenomenology. And this one is a rainbow ladder scheme. So what do you do there? You, you truncate on the level of the quark dyson schwinger equation only and combine the dressing of the gluon and the dressing of the quark gluon vertex together into an, a, a quantity which you call an effective running coupling. This comes along with the neglection of 11 of 12 tensor structures of the quark gluon vertex. So we only take into account the leading gamma mu structure of this vertex. Now, this is of course a much simpler truncation scheme. You don't have to solve all these equations here. Um, but of course, this comes as a price. And I would like to discuss this price a little bit with you um, um, when we go on the meson spectrum. So here we are. I actually don't know where this comes from. Um, this is the meson, the light meson spectrum um, for different quantum numbers. Here we have the pseudoscalar, the vector, the scalar, and two axial vectors. And here are exotic quantum numbers, which you cannot uh, um, populate in a non-relativistic QQBAR description of these mesons, in a relativistic calculation, you can actually produce these quantum numbers. What you see here in red are what we know from experiment from the PDG. What you see in blue are the results of a rainbow letter calculation done by my student uh, Stanislav Kubak. And what you see is that in a pseudoscalar channel, the, the, the pion is of course, um, always reproduced in, in such a framework, but also the, the vector, the rho meson, is, is right on top. So in the pseudoscalar and vector channel, uh, this truncation actually does very well. And we also did calculations in the two plus plus and three minus minus channels. And there are very good reasons to believe that in these channels, this truncation actually also works very well. However, for the axial vectors, you're just off. You're off by, by several hundred MeV um, in this rainbow letter calculation compared to experiment. In the scalar, we're off by an even larger margin. I will later on argue that the lowest state in this in the scalar sector is actually a, 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 a four quark state, so not a QQ bar state. So what we should actually get in a pure QQ bar calculation is something which, which lies somewhere around here, but you don't get that in this rainbow letter. If we now go to this much more advanced truncation that I discussed on the previous slide, this is what you find. And suddenly almost everything falls into place. You get the pion, you get the first radial excitation. 
you get the row, you get the first radial excitation, not too far away from the experiment. The scalar moves dramatically, but the new mass is above one GV, and the axle vectors are right on top of their experimental partners. Um, this, this spread actually is not a width, but this actually reflects an uncertainty of the calculation. So this is a, a technical thing, which I can explain in the discussion section if you want. And also for the exotic quantum numbers, so all these low-lying states that we had in rainbow letter just move up there. Um, and and we, in, in, the, in the one minus plus, at least we're in the ballpark of the experimental results. So clearly going beyond rainbow letter and including this full set of truncation uh, improves the calculation. Now, we, we can't do that in more complicated calculations. The meson spectrum is actually something, something simple in this framework. For the tetraquarks, we're not yet there. So for the remainder of this talk, when, when I discuss results on the heavy light tetraquarks, we're now doing rainbow letter. But since all the ingredients in the tetraquarks, as you will see, are basically important in a pseudoscalar and vector channel, this should work more or less. Okay, so what, what, what is the issue here? As it is already explained nicely in a couple of previous talks that we have all these extra states in the Charmonium sector, which we would like to describe. And we would actually like to learn uh, about their internal structure. Um, Vladimir discussed it in his talk you would like to know whether it's a compact tetraquark where all four quarks sit close together, or maybe it's a, it's a diquark anti diquark structure where, where there is some clustering into these, these colored diquark and anti diquark components. Or we would like to know whether it's a meson molecule where we have two heavy light mesons, which are separate clusters, or a heterogeneous cluster where the two heavy guys sit close to each other and then the light ones uh, are somewhere on the outside. And of course, instead of doing a model here, a model here, and a model here, and comparing the model results, what you would like to have is a framework which can accommodate all these, all these possibilities in, in one go, and actually then decide between these possibilities. And I would like to argue that this dyson schwinger bailey sapeta framework is one such framework. So the starting point is the relativistic equation for the, the heuristic four body equation. So this is a symbol for this four quark state. We have two quarks, two antiquarks. And on the right hand side, we have all the possible ways these quarks and antiquarks can interact. They are genuine two body interactions between the quark and antiquark combinations. There's an irreducible three body interaction, and there are irreducible four body interactions. Um, we have not yet found a way to include these terms. So at the moment, we neglect them. There are good arguments uh, when you deal with a three-body equation for baryons, why neglecting irreducible three-body forces in baryons is actually a, not a bad approximation. Uh, actually, these forces vanish to leading order in their skeleton expansion. And the quark dico picture is actually quite a very good picture for the baryon spectrum below 2 GV. Here we don't have these systematic arguments, apart from the fact, and I will come to that, that if there are strong two-body correlations in here, which dominate the equation, then certainly that would be a good argument to neglect these guys. And I will argue a posteriori that this is actually the case. Um, so these two-body interactions allow for internal clustering, and we use the rainbow letter to, to calculate these. Um, as I said, these equations are highly complicated. Actually, the wave functions for these uh, tetraquarks uh, contain 256 tensors, different tensor structures alone for the scalar tetraquark, and there are more tensor structures for tetraquarks with other quantum numbers. And the dressing functions to these depend on nine different Lorentz scalars. So unfortunately, there is no way right now with current computer resources that we can solve this system in full glory. So we have to reduce uh, the system. And we use it by using uh, roughly 20 tensor structures from here, which are guided by, by physics considerations. There's one more important technical point that I would like to address before I discuss the results. And this is the, the momentum structure here. 
Um, it turns out that it's actually very advantageous uh, to, to group these momenta in multiplets of the permutation group. Um, how does this look like? So P, Q, and K are the three different relative momenta that appear inside our four quark state. And this combination here is actually a singlet with respect to permutations. And then there are two doublets, so different combinations of this relative momenta, and they play a very, very important role in these tetra quarks. So this is the, the plane, uh, the two-dimensional plane of these two uh, doublet variables. And the shaded blue region here is the region which we actually probe in this four quark equation. So we integrate over this region here. Now it turns out that in this plane, you find the location of poles. So if, if these internal quantities here, for example, that quark and this antiquark have so much attraction that they cluster to each other that they form an internal meson cluster. For example, a pion inside a scalar tetraquark, then the poles of these, of these structures will appear in this plane. They will appear on this slide for the meson poles, on this line for the other combinations of mesons, on, on this line if there are strong diquark combinations. And that's very interesting because if you have a heavy light system, then this type of clustering where a C and C bar cluster together and a U and U bar corresponds to a heterogeneous picture. This type of clustering where we have a C bar and a U cluster and a C and a U bar cluster, so heavy light meson clusters, this is something you would expect if, if this object is close to a molecule. And of course, if the dike walk clusters, then this is what you see. Now, depending on the kinematics and the dynamics inside these tetra quarks, these locations of these poles come either close to this integration region, or they are further away, or they can even go inside this integration region, namely when we have resonance structures. And this, of course, affects the equation. And actually, it turns out that the, those structures that are closest to this region or even enter this region will more or less dominate the equation. And this gives us a handle on investigating different tetra quarks um, at the different tetra quark candidates and decide by which parts of the wave function uh, are dominating these guys. Um, we did a first calculation in the light uh, quark sector. Um, and we played the interesting game of switching on and off these doublet variables. If we don't take them into account when we solve this equation, it's just an ordinary four quark equation. And if, if each of these quarks roughly have a mass of three or 400 MeV, you add some, some binding energy, you would expect a bound state of roughly 1200 MeV, 1300, this is the order of magnitude. And this is actually what you find when you take internal clustering not into account. However, allowing for this internal clustering, the mass goes down to roughly 400 MeV. And in this case, for the light scalar tetra quark, the internal clustering, which is dominating everything else, is the pi pi cluster. So basically, what we describe here is a two pi on resonance. And of course, the mass and also the uh, potential width of this guy are, are just fitting the picture of the F0500 of the sigma meson. And we can do the same game uh, by uh, in including strange quarks. And then you get the mass, which is in the range of the kappa, and you get a mass, which is in the range of the A0 and the F0. So this looks like it, it, it works actually very well. On a side note, let me note that the dyquark correlations inside this guy do not play any role here. So they are, they are highly subleading. The state is really absolutely dominated by the pi pi cluster. Um, in, in a recent uh, publication, um, which is basically tied to the PhD thesis of Aniko Santowski, uh, we also included the mixing of this focal picture of the sigma with a QQ bar states. And we actually saw that this is a small effect. So this mixing includes some 10% corrections on the masses, but not more. So that, again, I, I think fits the picture. So finally, if you give me two or three more minutes, um, I come to the heavy light states. And, and let's start with the X3872. So what I show here is 
our calculation for the one plus plus state with two heavy quarks, two charm quarks, and two light quarks. And we play the game that we fix the charm quark masses, but we vary the masses of the light quark. We actually started to make these guys so heavy that they that this whole thing looks like a C, C, C bar, Z bar, uh, um, um, four quark state. And then we lower the mass of, of, the, the, of one of these C, C bar states to go down until at some point uh, this looks like a, a C, S, S bar, C bar state. And then here would be the physical point of a, a heavy light uh, a four quark state. Um, from this plot, you should take away two, two issues. Um, on the one hand, so the, the full calculation includes tensor structures that correspond to a DD star component. This is the, the heavy light meson component to a omega J psi component. That's a hydrogen component and an axial vector scalar dichroic component. That's the first component. That's the third component, which we include in the wave function of this guy. And we can compare which one is the most important by a calculation where we leave part of these possibilities out. And clearly, if you compare with just the DD star calculation with the full calculation, you don't find uh, great differences. So they're like almost on top of each other. So clearly this state is dominated by the DD star contribution, by the heavy light meson contribution. If you would do a calculation with only omega shape psi or only axial vector scalar dike, well, the masses would be up here. So far away from what we find for the full calculation. And in the limit here, we obtain with large arrow bars masses, which are right there what you, where you would expect them to describe by the X3872. So in this framework, the X3872 looks like it's heavily dominated by DD star components. And that actually ties in with a molecule picture of this state. What about the others? Of course, if you find a molecule picture for one of these four quark states, this does not mean that every other of these four quark states are also molecular. Remember, this framework allows to distinguish between different combinations. And it's a dynamical question which of these wave functions are actually dominated. So, it's a result that for the one plus minus, for example, again, the DD star dominates the equation. So this is the, the full calculation again, the crosses. The DD star is over here, um, but the contributions from other frameworks is somewhat larger than for the X3872. And here for the zero plus corresponding zero plus plus state, this is even more true. So here, this would be the a calculation with, with DD only. Uh, this is the full calculation. And there, there are clearly systematic shifts between the DD star only and the full calculation. So there is about, let's say, 10%. I mean, the error bars are so large that you can't really say that about a 10% contribution from other, from other internal configurations, so to say. Uh, all in all, however, we, at least for these, these hidden charm states, we see the dominance of this heavy light meson uh, components and the overall uh, spectrum looks, uh, the, the mass pattern actually matches the molecule picture, which has been advocated by, by Hanhard Klebe and Alter in, uh, in this publication. Last slide, um, we also had a look at open charm four quark states. Um, and here it looks like the, the DD star component is again dominating, but there are sizable contributions here from the dike walk, uh, um, frame from the, from the dike walk uh, wave functions. Um, here for the one plus, it's the axial vector scalar, which makes a sizable contribution. Here for the one plus, it's the axial vector axial vector, which makes a sizable contribution. So actually, here maybe this is the state with, with the most contribution from dike walks, as we see. However, probably for the, for the open charm, this is not so much as a surprise because the, the die quarks for the open charm actually match the hydrochromonium for the closed charm, right? Because they are the, the, the C and the C couple and, and the two light squawk coupled to each other to die quarks. Okay, so this is ongoing investigations. Um, this is my summary. I will not go through the summary again. Uh, maybe the most important issue is that what, what we're 
doing right now is we try to extend this framework. Uh, on the one hand, we try to include the mixing with QQ, sorry, the bar is here missing, the mixing with QQ bar, uh, which we studied already for light mesons um, by Nico. Uh, and we try, to, we try to do the same thing for the heavy quarks. And, and this is another thing which I did not have time to discuss in details, um, we have to improve our tools to go into the time-like complex plane to be able to really distinguish between different analytic, different potential analytic structures. Um, say, differentiate between resonances, virtual bound states, and bound states. And this is, again, an uh, ongoing work in progress. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Christian. Are there any questions? I have a question to the first part. Uh, you made several uncontrollable approximation, truncation, for example. Uh, comparison with the lattice calculations with their own problems also seems not very safe. Let me argue that there is a strict test of the results. We know that in pure gluodynamics, they are not globals. If we could, in the answer, make classical limit, which corresponds to rising coupling constant and rising mass, if you consider also fermions, then uh, we should see that the global, quantum global, disappears. It seems a strict test. Um, can, can you, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question correctly. So in pure Young-Mills theory, there are no quarks. So you're saying that in pure Young-Mills theory, there is a limit where the global disappears. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, exactly. It is easily provable theorem that globals are localized, uh, so, localized particle-like solution with finite energy does not appear in the pure gluodynamics. This is theorem uh, like the- mean pure gluodynamics? I mean, the MS theory is pure gluodynamics. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Ah, it's just young means. Young yeah. means classical without quantization. Ah, without classical. Okay, in the classical limit. Okay, okay. Yes, yes. There is easily probable theorem due to scale uh, transformations. This is the similar to the Derrick theorem. But there's, there's, I, I can see no reason why in the classical limit this should not happen. Here. You have solutions, quantum solutions. Yeah, absolutely. If you, you have parameters. Right? No, I don't have any parameters. Constant, coupling constant and masses. There are no masses here. There are no masses here. This is pure Engels theory. There are no masses in pure Engels theory. Oh, sure, sure, surely. It's a, even if you could mess, you can make classical limit. But in pure, in pure gluodynamics, quantum, glu, uh, quantum gluodynamics, if you find a global solution, you may try to test strictly that solution by that theorem of classical uh, limit. Maybe in the okay, I, I think about that. Yeah. yeah conversation I, section. If you have I think questions, we move I will answer. Uh, comment. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Mark. Yeah. Uh, I have also a question to you, Christian. Um, your tetra quark slide about one plus plus. Uh, as far as I got it, you plotted versus the total mass versus the light quark. Yes, absolutely. Right. Yes, yes, and uh, you tune the light quark mass up to the charm quark mass. Yeah, yes. exactly here. And if I'm not totally mistaken, it's significantly below the whatever shape psi, shape psi, or eta c, eta c threshold. Yes, yes, and yes. If yes. I remember Vladimir's talk, he also investigated this and found it significantly above. So my question to both of you is, maybe also for the discussion session, who is right and who is wrong? Uh, first of all, I have two, two, two answers to this. The first part of the answer is that um, this C, C, C bar, C bar has not the correct wave function for a real C, C, C bar, C bar. 
the, the, the symmetries are different. So uh, actually, we, we use the symmetries of the heavy light system and just make the quarks more heavy. That, that's all. Uh, however, the, the, the flavor and color wave functions in a, in a physical C, C, C bar, C bar state would be different. And that would affect the calculation. So uh, this, the, the, the mass that we find here should not be compared and, sh and should not be seen as a prediction for a, a physical C, C, C bar, C bar state. Okay. This is the one part of the answer. And the second part of the answer is that, yes, it may very well be, I mean, as I said, this is a, it, it's a, it, the, the underlying interaction is rainbow letter. This is a simple model. Um, this calculation was not meant to be a quantitative calculation. This is a pioneering calculation and we were aiming for qualitative aspects. And the qualitative aspect is that this DD star is dominating everything. And I'm pretty sure, although I would need to do the calculation to show that, but my gut feeling is that this, this ordering will survive when we crank up the truncation. Um, we are currently, we have started a program to systematically address this curve using different variants of this rainbow letter and actually going beyond rainbow letter. This is ongoing work. And I hope within one or two years, I can tell you more about the, the, the quality of that curve as a whole. Mm -hmm. I think but, but for really now, this really has to be taken with a big grain of salt. So I think that's a good place where to. Where Thanks, to Christian. Stop the session. <laughs>